Welcome back to session two. Now we're talking about believe. What do we believe about the Bible? What do we believe that it teaches us for how we should live our life? And I hope you look in the workbook, a lot of great information in there. We're not gonna hit it all, we'll hit the highlights. But I encourage you to read through the entire thing and then contact us if you have any questions. So what does the Bible actually say about our life? One thing I've learned in my years in church and years as a believer is that becoming a fully committed follower of Christ takes work. We don't just mature automatically because we hang around the church setting. It takes diving into the Word. It takes studying with other believers. It takes prayer and allowing the Holy Spirit to speak into our life. And I'm convinced now more than ever that everything we need to know about life we can find in the pages of Scripture. But often I get questions actually about the Bible itself. Like, Pastor, how do we know that the Bible is authentic? How do we know that these are the actual words of God to my life? How do we know what's literal and what's figurative? What words do I take at actual face value? And what are the words do we have to see spiritual meaning behind? And those are all great questions. So let's look at a few things that we have written down in the workbook that I think will make it easier for you to understand. And let's begin by answering the question, what makes the Bible so unique? Well, it's the most published book of all time. It's an all-time bestseller. It's the most translated book in the history of the world. It's documented to have greater influence than any other book in any kind of literature in the Western world. It has a continuity of message written over a 1500 year span, over 40 generations, written by more than 40 authors varying from kings to peasants, from fishermen to statesmen, from scholars to poets, it was written on three different continents. It was written in at least three different languages. And yet, it is one unfolding story of God's plan to reveal himself to his people and redeem them for time and eternity. It also predicts the future. More than 300 Old Testament prophecies were fulfilled when Jesus Christ was born and lived his life. It has stood the test of time. It is proven reliable on the basis of bibliographic, historical, and archeological texts countless number of old manuscripts, and yet they all say the same thing. Historically, short time span between certain events and the original recordings and those manuscripts written down lets us know that the story didn't change over generations, that they were written down as they actually happened. Other non-biblical historians substantiate the reliability of the Bible in their own writings. And then, of course, over the last several decades, archeological finds and excavations have proven the Bible to be true. Well, then we come to this thing called the canon, which are the actual books in the Bible. How do we know which books are authentic? How do we know about the books that were left out of the Bible? Why weren't those included? So let's talk about the 66 books that are in the Bible as we know it today. Well, the Bible is composed of 66 different books by 40 different writers written over a span of 1,500 years. And yet, there's only one storyline running through the whole thing. These people were never all together. These people never heard all the same stories. They were on different parts of the world in different continents, different locations, and yet the Holy Spirit spoke through all of them at different times and places to create a story that was the same no matter who was speaking into it. You can read in your booklet about how it became commonplace and used by the early church leaders and why they trusted its veracity. In fact, we list a website there where you can go learn even more information if you'd like about the authenticity of scripture. One thing's for sure, God was orchestrating everything as it came together and we can know without a shadow of any doubt that the Bible as we know it today is the authentic, real word of God for us. And then we get into this concept of translations. There's so many different types of Bibles out there. How do we know which ones to read? How do we know which ones have been translated correctly? Well, there's three basic types of translations out there. There's the idea of word for word, where they go back to the original language and translate each word individually. There's this idea of thought for thought, which is, okay, what was that sentence trying to say? Now let's convey that same thought in modern language. And then there's the idea of the paraphrase, something like the Message Bible, which you don't want to build theology on. You don't want to use it necessarily to preach on a Sunday morning, 
but it gives voice to sometimes how we feel as humans. And I think there's value in reading all three of them, to be honest. I study from all three of them. But as you try to find a version that speaks to you, that makes sense, I always encourage people to lean more toward the word for word or the thought for thought translations than I do the paraphrases. And you can check that graph in your study materials to help you better understand where most translations fall. So now let's talk about our core beliefs. You know, as many Christians as there are, that's how many different sets of beliefs there are. We're never all gonna agree on everything. But I'm of the firm belief that there's a few things that we need to come into agreement on. And we're gonna talk about those right now as the core beliefs of our church. As you may or may not know, we are affiliated with the Assemblies of God, which is a very old denomination, been around for quite some time. And technically it's not even a denomination. It's a fellowship of churches who choose to join themselves voluntarily. But what we have in common are these core beliefs. And if you've ever heard that word doctrine, it simply just means something that we believe. Uh, sometimes it involves a creed or a certain way of saying something that expresses that or a paragraph that summarizes what we can all agree on. So in the book, you're going to see things like God and salvation and humanity in the Bible. And I encourage you to read all those for yourself. But let me tell you what really matters. Here's the core belief that really matters for us that we preach at Monterey Bay Christian Center. Jesus is the way to God. Jesus is who you need for salvation. There's nothing we can do. There's nothing that I can do in and of myself to earn salvation. I can't be good enough no matter how hard I try. I can't work it. I can't buy it. It's only because of the grace of God through the person of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross, burial, resurrection, that I am saved. That's the core belief that we all have to agree on. We also believe that that salvation that comes through Jesus is available to everyone. For some people who would say that it's only for certain select individuals that God chooses, we reject that completely. We believe the Bible very clearly teaches that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord can be saved. And as far as I'm concerned, if we can agree on that, the rest we can figure out because that is the core doctrine that matters. And if you choose to pursue membership here at the church, or even if you don't and you just wanna talk and you've got questions about some of these doctrines, some of these teachings, I would love to discuss them with you further. I wanna to touch on just a couple other things that aren't necessarily core doctrines, but they're values that we have here. If you visited one of our services, then you know that worship, the demonstrative act of singing and raising our hands and clapping our hands and glorifying God for who He is and what He's done for us is a big part of who we are. You know, I don't think everybody has to worship that way, but there's something about the Psalms which instructs our life. And it talks about those things. It talks about clapping our hands. It talks about lifting our voices. It talks about raising our hands. And I just know in my life that when I release myself in worship and I forget about what's going on around me, I forget about the chaos of my life that week, but I just come in and focus on Jesus. And I focus on what he's done for me. And I begin to glorify God for who he is and what he's done rather than always asking him for something or trying to wonder if I'm worthy enough. I'm not worthy enough, but he chooses to make me worthy. There's some kind of freedom that comes in worship. And so you will find at our church, worship is a big part of what we do. You'll also notice that we have male and female alike serving in ministry. We believe in the concept of equality in ministry. We believe that everyone can be called and used by God. So there are no restrictions on ministry here at our church. We also teach the concept of tithing or financial support. Now this is a hot button issue and you're never gonna hear me say that you've got to tithe to go to heaven, nothing like that. But I do believe tithing, which is an Old Testament principle which predates the law, was something that was instituted by God as a way of sacrificing part of what we have that comes in, which really the Bible teaches us is all His anyway. That as we give back a portion to God of what He's entrusted to our care, that it invites the blessing of God on what we have left over. So we talk about it, we teach on it. We believe God loves everybody the same whether you give a penny or give a million dollars. But I challenge you as you explore this topic, I've always seen in my life, my dad taught me this, is somehow 90% goes farther than 100. I don't know how that's possible. I can only tell you that it does. And when you trust God with your money, it opens the doors for God to bless what you have left over. One of my favorite people who teaches on this is Pastor Robert Morris. And if you'd like more information on this topic, there's some resources here in the workbook, or you can just Google Pastor Robert Morris and watch some of his videos on giving and tithing, and I promise you that you're gonna be blessed. Another big portion of what we believe is that spending time in the Word is essential to our lives as believers. And so we encourage everyone to develop a strong devotional time. 
fact, the Bible tells us there's several ways to interact with the Word of God. We can hear it, we can read it, we can study it, we can meditate on it, we certainly can memorize it, and most importantly, we should obey it. And there's some teaching here in the workbook that helps you understand guidelines for interpreting Scripture. And a lot of people who read the Bible and they get confused because they've just never been shown how, they've never been taught. So we put some things in the workbook here to help you with exactly that. Things like the simple and obvious meaning of the Bible was usually the intended one. Or being sure to not consider a verse out of context, understanding what's going on around it and what led up to that point and why the Bible is saying what it's saying at that point. So read the whole story, not just one verse or two and try to make a doctrine out of it. Considering verses in the light of God's character and who He is as a God who loves people. And then just honestly using common sense as to meaning. Sometimes Jesus used a hyperbole. He used an exaggeration to make a point. And then know this, the promises of God, well, some are unconditional, but some are very conditional upon what we do. So don't assume that what the Bible says to someone else necessarily applies to you. Again, go back to context, see what it says, see what was going on. And then the most important thing is just ask the Holy Spirit to reveal truth to you. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you understand what is being said in that passage. I can't tell you how many times I've read a passage that I've read dozens of times before and gotten something out of before where the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And I go back and read it again, and this time the Holy Spirit shows me a new nuance, some of the wrinkle that I hadn't seen before that opens up a whole new facet of truth for where I am right now in my life instead of where I was several weeks or months ago the last time that I read it. And this is part of grow. This is part of helping each other become who we're supposed to be in Christ. And as we grow and mature in Christ, it helps us understand how to use those gifts that God has placed in our life. We're gonna talk about that next in Become.